Okay, so he's gonna be pulling that around in a couple of minutes. This Cuda has been here two and a half years. You know that because you've worked I on it. I was here when I came. Yep. You're new, you're new to everything that's here. That car, when it started life, was in worse shape, absolutely worse shape than any other car that we've we got out here. we do this inside? It's really hot. Yeah. Should've did it on the shade inside. We just, like, no, we can't Can we roll it. through this quicker? Or? The bottom line is, 1970 Cuda 340 automatic rear window louvers, hockey stick stripe, rear spoiler. It's, 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 on wind. it's like rain. This car, I'll, I'll show you. Here it comes. There it is. Ha <laughs> ha. Wow. Hey, rewind that. On this very special episode of Graveyard Cars, we reveal the last ditch efforts to restore our 1970 340 Cuda, revealing never before seen insight into its engine failures. Watch our newest ghoul, Dave, race against the clock to assemble and detail this car to perfection. Witness American Muscle Restored on this episode of Graveyard Cars. The little 1970 Cuda 340 car, we didn't cover a lot of the early part of the restoration on the car, pri primarily because we have a lot of cars, very rare cars that we focus on. They built 1,788 340 automatic 70 Cudas. Very few of them had the hockey stick stripe, which this one was optioned for, has the original fender tag. This one was optioned for the rear window louvers, which allegedly is about 1% of all the muscle cars got those. So if you started to do a mathematical breakdown, it could be one of just, you know, 100 or 200, but it's still a 70 Cuda 340, very deserving of being restored, which is why we did it. But it's not gonna compete for, you know, the, the top prize at a, at a car show next to a, a Hemi Cuda convertible. Once we had the 340 completely rebuilt and painted on an engine stand, the next step was to put it together with the transmission. So we joined those two pieces together, installed them on the K-member, built out the rest of the front suspension and drivetrain, and then I had Royal and the rest of the ghouls install it in the car. Once we had the front end, the suspension, the engine, transmission installed, we installed the detailed out eight and three quarter rear end, which had a 323 sure grip in it. Bumpers went on it, the uh, hockey stick stripe went on it, the rear window louvers, hood pins, ornamentation for the hood that called out the 340. Things like that were all done at the old shop. So at kind of an outside glance, it almost looked like it was done, but if you tipped your head inside, you'd see there was no guts inside of it, and a lot of things weren't done under the hood. It was at that point that we were getting close to a transition into the new shop, so we loaded it up on the rollback, moved it over to the new shop for its final resting place before it was finished. When we took on the project, I had given the client my word that it was a 24 month turnaround. Um, at the time 24 months had hit, literally there was about eight months worth of work left on the car. So I, I got called out on the carpet, so to speak, by the owner saying, look, I've been patient 24 months, but you're months and months and months away from having this thing done. All those things are some of the stimulus behind why we made changes to the staff, changes to the shop. We needed to be um, on the offense rather than always on the defense. And one of the first things I did to put us on the offense was to hire Dave. My name's uh, David Ray. Uh, I was a truck driver up in Montana and uh, put in the application through Facebook, probably pretty close to early December. You know, I didn't think, you know, I'd ever get a call or, or anything like that. I've been, you know, working on Mopars my whole life. I, I know them inside and out and, you know, really uh, have a passion for the cars and have a passion for the way Mark restores them, which is, you know, to OEM, you know, original, just like the way they, you know, came off showroom four, you know, back in, you know, 69, 70, whenever they were produced. So it's like a Disneyland for me. This is, this would be my Disneyland. Because I hadn't really had any experience with Dave other than just looking at his resume, this was a great candidate for him to cut his teeth on. On the shift linkage on the 340 Cuda, uh, there wasn't too many challenges. Uh, automatics fairly straightforward and, and pretty easy. Uh, so Mark told me he wants to get the uh, 340 Cuda running. So I'm gonna get it all plumbed and get all the spark plug wires and everything set up, get firing order up TDC, get all fluids filled up and checked out. So uh, I'm real excited to hear it run. It's not a super high dollar numbers matching car. Um, if there are mistakes, if there are errors, or if there are things that go on that, um, that we really wish hadn't, it's not gonna be as detrimental to the bottom line or to, or to the timeline for that matter. So uh, a really good choice for him to get started at Graveyard Cars with. I thought that was a symbol, 148. Yeah. Now what are we doing? The guy that doesn't work. Does that look like what? that same marking to you? 
inherently the most tedious part of an OE restoration, by definition, is the fact that you're putting it back together OEM. If you don't have a perfect unrestored original example setting next to you, you need reference material. That's why I use Dave's books. Dave Weiss has been putting these books out for several years now. They are the most comprehensive and accurate set of books that you can buy for OEM restoration. He has all kinds of stuff. You got your nuts, bolts, and fasteners, which is very important. Then OE uh, judging and, and top finer points of detail. And that's where we learn what markings go on an engine uh, or on a rear end or on a transmission. So I always go to those books when I don't have an exact perfect original copy to go from. Anyway, if I put that in there and I just need to connect a cable underneath there for the starter, we could probably get that thing running. You just want to get it running this morning? I want to get it, I, I gotta get it done. You just got to get it done. Really? done. Yeah. Uh, looks like we're going to get the engine started, so I'm pretty nervous, but uh, I hope it all goes well. Uh, I checked all my uh, things twice, so uh, thinking, keeping positive thoughts. So how are we starting this without the wiring, boss? We're just going to use a remote starter on it. So what we'll do is... Still got to run a hot wire to the coil. Well, this one doesn't have yeah. the dash in it. Yeah, we'll have to run a hot wire over to the coil. house resistor. Uh, so we don't have the dash right now for the 340 CUDA, so we have to hot wire it, uh, which isn't too difficult. We just run a hot lead from the battery uh, directly to the ballast resistor to charge the coil and uh, put a remote starter on the starter uh, so we can light it up. That's why they have a ballast resistor in there. Okay. So a lot of people that hotwire a car, they'll take a wire from the positive side, which is a full 12 volts, probably closer to 13 by the time they're all charged up, even 14 in some cases. So we're getting right, ready to light off the 340 CUDA. So I'm hoping everything goes well. I'm pretty nervous. Uh, this is our first motor uh, I'm going to light off. So uh, I'm pretty excited and nervous all at the same time. Yeah, I'm going to blow this baby up and see Blow this baby up. It'll rip. You know, in a twist of irony, uh, we had not actually received our engine run stand uh, until after the engine was already built, painted, and ready to go together. So I didn't have an opportunity to fire this engine up prior to this. So I'm a little bit nervous because I, I've had it bite me in the butt before, and that's why we have the engine run stand. So now it's almost like, okay, a little bit of rolling the dice. Uh, I have confidence in my engine building, but at the same time, it's nice to have that extra little good feeling that you know the engine's already been started, already been ran, already been broke in, and is ready to go. I'm gonna hook that lead up. One yeah. of the things that'll help a lot, yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I just... Oh, that sounded good. Advance it, bring it towards me. There you go. Try it there a little bit. So we tried firing up 340, and uh, it kind of started died, started died. Uh, I, I'm hoping all my plumbing's correct. I double checked all my firing order, and. Everything looks good. It looks like the timing's pretty close. Uh, so uh, we're, we're hoping we can get it going. We never ran this engine on the engine run stand, so. Yeah, I don't think you ever did. Uh, it'd be pretty embarrassing being the new guy here and, and you know, this being my first motor uh, that it didn't start because of something I did wrong. So I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping everything works out. So if those lifters quiet down. Most cars require some kind of a ritual when you go to start them. They either need a primer or fuel, or they need a jump start, or they need extra voltage to them. Uh, in this particular case, it's not a good sign because it's cranking over, but it's not firing. Dump fuel down it, we'll get a little bit of a pop, but I have a feeling that at the very least, we have a fuel starvation problem. I just hope that it's not anything worse than that. It's okay, gonna take a little fuel. Got nothing up yet. Let's take a look underneath the car, see what kind of hazards we have. Just with a preliminary look around, I've got a few drips, a few leaks, which is normal, but that's not gonna cause the problem we're having with the engine. Yeah, I'll dump some more fuel in there. And then dump a little bigger pile in here. Oops, yeah, it's oh, dumping hey, out yeah. the carburetor now. Oh. Uh, we found the vacuum plugs were missing off the carburetor, and uh, that would you know, determine whether it was idling or not. Uh, so we can get it to start, but it just wouldn't stay running. So obviously, we kind of determined we got a big vacuum leak and so that could just be a part of the problem. Stay tuned as the ghouls overcome one of the biggest multifaceted engine failures in the history of graveyard cars and answer the ultimate question, did someone sabotage the engine? On this very special episode of Graveyard Cars, we reveal the last ditch efforts to restore our 1970 340 CUDA and answer the ultimate question, did someone sabotage the engine?
backed up on. Oh, you need a back, yeah. Yeah. And is there one on the back of the carburetor? No, nope, that one's not in the back. Ah, there we go. Okay, the plug, so what's we're going we on right now, vacuum. we got a huge vacuum source in the back of the carburetors. There's ported and there's manifold vacuum. This is ported vacuum. It goes on the top side of the primary circuit. So as soon as you pull it off of an idle, you have vacuum right here. The other one, while it's idling, you have vacuum all the time at the back one. So okay, the port well, in the back is constant manifold vacuum. Anytime it's running, that one in the back sucking. And that one back there is a huge hole. It's a 3 8 hole like that. So right now what we're running with is, yeah. Did that come with it? It was up yeah. on the bench. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. So let me see it. It was miss, yeah. Miss so we crazy. just got in a hurry and, and forgot to put it on. I actually, I think, you I don't want to blame anybody, but I think Royal put the carburetor on. <laughs> Royal put no, the carburetor on, no, he just fine. forgot I'm to put the plug it. in the back of it. That's all. This plug goes right in that main port. So the ported, the manifold vacuum, right now it's like, it's like drilling a 3 8 hole in the intake manifold. It's running way too lean. So as soon as we put this in and we cap off this other ported vacuum, I think we're gonna start getting a, a, a nice idle to it. Dave is a Mopar technician, self-taught all of his life. If he does do a remarkable job, like I'm suspecting he will, because I hired him, I can turn him loose with the high dollar stuff. The Hemi Charger, the six-pack Challenger, the convertible, two Hemi convertible four-speed cars. I mean, we have cars that need that technician, and I'm rooting for him to be that technician. Well, basically, uh, well I started with just a bare motor with the carburetor on it. Uh, and I, I had to install the, the alternator, of course, uh, all the brackets, uh, pulleys, power steering pump, get all the power steering lines hooked up. You know, basically everything you see on here, all your upper, lower radiator hoses, your distributor, all your spark plugs, plug wires, all the hoses, all the wiring in the car. And as you can see, uh, the car still doesn't have the dash assembly in it, so we have no uh, heater core in there, so I actually ran a bypass line on here so we can get it running today. Yeah, we got oil in it and uh, antifreeze in it, transmission fluid, some power steering fluid, so as long as we get spark and fuel, we should be ready to go. Right there. Just used to it. If it's advanced too far, yeah. it starts kicking back. Yeah. So I'll go, burr, 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 burr. that's too far back. If it goes the other way, it doesn't fire at all. It just goes, burr, 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 burr. so right in the middle is that sweet spot. Yeah. I can usually set them right on the money by ear. So, yeah. uh, yeah, I'm nope. sure, Dave. That's, that's right there. Okay. Did you dump a little more fuel in there? You're gonna need a little more fuel. You're gonna need a little more fuel. It, it can go back to the fuel pump. And uh, the fuel pump drives, it's a manual fuel pump. It's got like an arm on it. And where the timing chain is, you know, when everything, there's a, an actual cam drive. It's this, uh, it's like a disc that's bolted on the upper sprocket of the camshaft that's kind of offset. When it comes around, it bumps that arm on the fuel pump, and that's what pumps the, the manual fuel pump in this case. Whenever they assembled the motor, if they didn't put that cam drive on the actual camshaft on that sprocket, then it's not going to operate the fuel pump. And if they did not put that eccentric on the timing chain, then that's a whole nother world of hurt. That means the motor's got to come out, the whole front of the motor's got to come off. So we're hoping it's not that. We're hoping we're just don't have enough fuel in the fuel tank to get a good draw. While I was bringing the fuel around to put into the CUDA because it wouldn't start, I happened to notice that the sending unit was sitting over there on the bench, not installed in the tank, which is a great reason why it wouldn't run. You were looking for it, you left it. <laughs> I didn't leave it out, I didn't put the tank in. Mm, no, no, we're <laughs> going down. So no. Working with Dave now uh, has been a joy. He knows what he's doing. He follows instructions, he's got a great attitude, and it seems to me that he's a real good diagnostician. This guy actually takes his time and diagnoses it. He's kind of a mini me, if you will, which the world needs more of. Well, this is the part we're missing on the fuel tank. Fuel sending unit, and pickup unit. Uh, this deal right here, this float, operates your fuel gauge, and this is where the fuel draws from. So this is what we're missing. This is why we're not getting any fuel up to our fuel pump. Let's start this mother humper. That not sound good. The Plymouth Barracuda was changed slightly from the 1970 to the 1971 model. What was changed? New grill, new tail lights, new headlights. The answer coming up after the break. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report.
So what was changed on the 1971 Plymouth Barracuda model year? The answer, all of the above. It received a new grill, new taillight design, new headlights on top of other amenities. These changes are what powered that vehicle to become the most collectible Mopar muscle car of all time. It has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. On this very special episode of Graveyard Cars, we reveal the last ditch efforts to restore our 1970 340 Cuda. Witness American muscle restored on this episode of Graveyard Cars. Let's start this mother humper. That not sound good. The engine is making a metallic knocking sound. It can be a multitude of things from the rocker arms, rocker shafts, lifters. It can be telegraphing out of the transmission, the torque converter, the flex plate. The crankshaft could have a problem. The only thing I hope is whatever it is that's causing this unfavorable sound is not a massive overhaul. Okay, it's in, it's in the revolution of the motor. It's, it's not top end, it's got to be. So it could be the starter. The starter would be hanging out, I, right? I grabbed it and it was fine. I grabbed it when it was running, it wasn't that. I, if I can't feel anything anywhere, you know, any vibration. Turn the drive shaft. Can't. Like, I'm wondering, you adjusted all that linkage while it was on the ground, right? Not running, obviously. No, no, not running, just actually in the air. I didn't even really get all the linkage adjusted, it's just installed. Could it be the park pole not parking? Could be. Okay, well, we got a clicking sound on the motor, and we kind of determined it might be the parking rod. Whenever the, the automatic transmission's kind of caught in between gears, uh, the little parking rod will kind of click, so it'll create a clicking sound. Uh, so we kind of determined that might be the problem, so we're gonna kind of mess with the linkage and see if that solves our noise issue. But it didn't feel like it, but yeah. it sure sounds like it. It does, inside. It's just, it's because it's the same RPM as the engine. You know, if it was number one rocker, it exactly. wouldn't, it'd have to wait eight times to come up, mm -hmm. seven, seven times before it'd come up. So it's got to be in there, which is good, but it beats an internal problem. Upon removing the inspection cover, we've seen some rubbing marks on the inspection cover. So that was creating our little tinny sound. Uh, so now that we got the, uh, the flex plate straightened out, we were able to put a, a pry bar in there and just take the little tweak out of it and got our inspection cover uh, fixed. Uh, hopefully that's going to take care of our sound and we'll have a, a really smooth, nice sounding motor. Hoping it moved just a hair. Probably didn't. Probably have to take the engine out. Uh, we're gonna take the car outside and run it for a little while longer, try to put a little load on it, and see if it improves or if it gets worse. I don't know what it is. I just hope that it's nothing massive because that's going to be a setback we just can't afford right now. now. Some engines are just dreams. The other ones just fight you the whole way. Seems, seems to just fight all the way. What the f*** happened? What the f*** just happened? You know? Why the f*** it got a tap? What's that bull about? Uh, well, we solved our tinny sound uh, with the flex plate and that, but now, unfortunately, we have a knocking sound and it seems like the longer we run it, it's progressively getting worse. Engines shouldn't make noise when you first start them. This has a metallic clanking sound to it. It's so loud that I can't tell whether it's in the, the valve train, if it's in the lifters, if it's telegraphing out of the torque converter where maybe the flex plate's hitting the, the shield. Is it a lower bottom end? I don't know what it is. I just hope that it's nothing massive because that's gonna be a setback we just can't afford right now. Hopefully it's the lifters and they bump up, I don't know. Does it still sound like it's coming out of there or does it sound like it's coming out of this side now? Still sounds to me like it's over there. What do you think, Royal? Well, you know that ain't right. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's simple as can be and it just is. It's not. This station will remain on the air day and night. 
On this very special episode of Graveyard Cars, we reveal the last-ditch efforts to restore our 1970 340 Cuda. Witness American muscle restored on this episode of Graveyard Cars. not sound good. Well, what's going on is we had uh, two problems with our 340. We actually had three problems. When we initially fired it off, it was running on about six cylinders. So we did a quick compression test to find out it had low compression on it. And it, what had happened is I built the engine like a year ago and it had been sitting around. So I thought that the rings maybe had frozen onto the piston, maybe not swollen out where they're supposed to be originally. We took it out back and we ran it till it got up to regular temperature. What the f***ing tapping? What the f***s the tapping? You huh? know? It actually overheated, which is probably good because it raised everything up to where it needed to be. And that let go of the ring, so we got our compression back. So that was one problem down. But now we've got an intake leak, a uh, vacuum leak, so it didn't want to idle under 2,000 RPM. And we've got a tappet that's making noise or some kind of metallic noise that sounds like a tappet. So that's why we had to take the intake and the rockers back off again. <laughs> Okay, let's just go ahead and take the rocker room assembly off of there, push rods, let's get everything over to the solvent tank, wash it down, and take a look at it. Yep, Okay. Ready to go look at all the rockers. All right. Sounds good. I'm gonna clean these rockers up to see if I can find out if there's a plugged up oil galley, any cracks, you know, something that might cause us to lose pressure up there to make these clatter. Huh. We have a slightly bent push rod, folks. So there's one bent push rod. The bent push rods are something that uh, usually happens when an engine backfires sometimes. It puts a lot of pressure on that valve instantly and it can cause a bend in it. Uh, if a, an engine seizes, the top end's still moving, that can cause a bent push rod. The bends in these rods, there's only a few and they're very, very slight. So I don't think that they're the contributing factor to, uh, certainly not our noise, but they could be contributing to our poor run condition. Yeah, watch. More oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Here's this is the one in the suspect hole. That's the one in the hole that I suspect made a noise. So I think there's only so many things that can cause that clattering. So <clears throat> I'm gonna order the lifters, the rock. Uh, those are little mushrooms. What, were you were you interrupting me here? Sorry. It's okay. Just looking like I know you like mushrooms. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Since we're chasing down a multitude of problems with the engine, the noise primarily, and the poor run condition on it, uh, I think it's just going to be prudent to go back through, change out the rocker shaft assemblies with another used known good one that we have here, put in all new lifters and all new push rods, and really, by and large, that should take care of our problem. And then look at the intake. Yeah. This came with so you the kit. You had a leak, right? I mean, look obviously. at it. Part of the runnability with the engine is going to be the intake leak. Uh, typically speaking, when I put these LA engines together, the 273, 318, 340, 360s, I just use a gasket type material that goes between the manifold and the heads. This particular engine kit came with a metallic one, very similar to the big blocks that use the valley pan. They have a metallic gasket that has a raised rib around it. That raised rib is designed that when it's sandwiched between the mating surface of the cylinder head, and the mating surface of the intake manifold, it smashes that flat and that creates your seal. In this case, we had some of the rib on portions of the manifold gasket that were crushed, but then we had other ones that weren't even touched, telling me it was a direct intake leak. So hopefully a combination of the direct intake leak, the bent push rods, possibly a lifter that's collapsed and not running right, should cure all of our problems. It's crushed down here, it's crushed on this, but look at these up here. Yeah. It wasn't even seating. Uh-uh. So. So we replace the intake gasket and we go back together, obviously, and that should cure our problem. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. On this very special episode of Graveyard Cars, we reveal the last ditch efforts to restore our 1970 340 Cuda and answer the ultimate question, did someone sabotage the engine?
So right now what we're doing is the guys are uh, going back together with the top end on the 340. When we tore it apart, we really didn't find too much that was definitive other than the intake gasket wasn't completely smashed and sealed. So I think that our intake was our, uh, was our leak. So while we had it apart to do the intake, I just decided that'd be a good time to go ahead and put in the uh, brand new set of lifters and brand new set of push rods on it. That's all going back together. They're just buttoning it up the top end, so we should be able to fire it up here in about 10, 15 minutes. Hopefully, the clattering noise is gone and the vacuum leak is gone. So all the guys got to put on right now is hook up the fuel line, the PCB hose. Oh yeah, I didn't do those. Uh, route the plug wires, which he's almost done with now. And I just topped off the power steering, so we're ready to run here in a few minutes. Yeah. We're gonna put uh, Bob's car outside and uh try to get it running, you know, and hopefully uh, all the work that we did on it is gonna solve our, our issue with the motor problem. That's the way it's supposed to run. Let me have just a hair more timing. Up ahead? Yep. Yep. Right now we're just letting it break in. It sounds like it's running a whole lot better. Sounds like we might have got rid of our vacuum leak, so we're just gonna run it up to operating temperature, about 2,000 RPM. And uh, as soon as it's all warmed up and broke in, we can set the idle down, set the timing, set the air fuel. Hopefully the lifters get a little quieter. Mopars aren't the greatest oiling engines in the world. Sometimes they take longer than others. Come on, baby. Uh, so everything really, for the most part now, is starting to dial back in. I don't know if it was a lifter or a push rod or a combination of both of them that were making all the noise that has quieted down quite a bit. Definitely is running better. We still got to get it up to operating temperature. Uh, he's checking the water on it right now. We may need to add some to that. Uh, if we can get it to run and idle and do all the things it's supposed to do, we can set the timing on it. And uh, hopefully after that, we're ready to pull it back inside and start putting it together. Thing is, we're Royal wanted to just, you know, tear the whole thing apart. He, wanted, he said, oh, well, let's take it apart. And the, the rings are probably in backwards or something, you know. It's like me and Dave, I was telling Dave, you know, it's, I don't think so. You know, I, I put the motor together myself. Dave, is that right? That's right. So Royal, Royal's a parts replacer. He goes bananas. Something doesn't work out. He just wants to start throwing parts. Let's rip it around. We can have that engine out in an hour. We'll take the rings off. And no, let's just get it hot, and, and it'll let go of those rings. I was telling him. You know, Dave and me were in complete agreement, right, Dave? That's right. We're in complete agreement on uh, the fact that it didn't need to come apart. But Royal being a parts, he's just crazy. He loves putting parts on an engine. So I don't mean it disrespectful, but you know. Now that we got the engine running good, uh, I can finally start working on the interior. I've been waiting to get this done. I mean, uh, this motor's been kind of holding us up, so now I can get all the seats, carpet, all the fun stuff in and, and get this car wrapped up. Uh, the interior's uh, challenging to do. Uh, the carpet a lot of times doesn't always fit right. Uh, you try to put it out in the sun, hope for a real hot day and get it nice and warm so it'll kind of conform, get your glue spread. That's usually the most challenging part. Uh, the rest is pretty cut and dry. I mean, installing seats, rear seats are usually a pain. Uh, new interior isn't smashed like original interior is. The seats just don't pop in. Uh, they take a lot of work to get them in. Uh, but other than that, I mean, once, once everything starts flowing, I mean, you keep pretty good rhythm and get it knocked out pretty fast. Uh, now that the interior's done, uh, the car's totally come alive. It looks totally awesome. Uh, it's just, it's, it's coming together just perfectly. It's time to finally get the windshield in the car. Once we get the windshield in and get all our surround uh, molding put in, we're ready to rock and roll. Come in and watch a little graveyard cars. What can I do for you, my friend? Uh, I got some bad news and I got some worse news. No shit. Yeah. True or false? In 1971, the option list did not offer the single four barrel 440 HP on the Plymouth Barracuda or the Dodge Challenger. The answer coming up after the break. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. So, was the single four barrel 440 HP engine not on the options list for the 1971 Plymouth Barracuda and Dodge Challenger? The answer is true. 
For reasons unknown, the single 4 barrel 440 HP was not available in the E-Body in 71. It was available in 70, of course, and then no big blocks were available from 72 to 74. In 1971, if you had an E-Body and you wanted a 440, you got three two barrel carburetors. This incredible story becomes more ghastly with each report. On this very special episode of Graveyard Cars, we reveal the last ditch efforts to restore our 1970 340 CUDA and answer the ultimate question, was the 340 engine sabotaged? So we got our heater box all, all built out, all rebuilt. So it's time to install the heater box and get our heating system all put in, all the cables and stuff hooked up so uh, we can stay nice and toasty in uh, the wintertime here in Oregon. Well, when in doubt, I always end up checking uh, reference photos, whether it's photos I take with my phone out in the yard uh, of perfectly original cars, just to see how everything is supposed to go together just perfectly, the uh, way everything's routed. Uh, when all else fails, I go to the Dave Weiss books uh, in our library, we got an awesome library, it has all the restoration guides and shows some great pictures, but when all else fails, you can't beat a picture, it's worth a thousand words. Come in and watch a little graveyard cars. Oh yeah. Look at that, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Any better than that. What kind of people are uh, I got some bad news and I got some worse news. On what? A little 340 on the orange car, the orange Cuda, 70 Cuda, it's knocking again. What the f wrong with that thing? Just one thing after another on it. What's the worst news? Uh, there is no worst news. I just thought that would soften the blow a little bit. <laughs> hey, fast forward that fool. While our film crew was being existential down in Las Vegas, some big show, we sent the 340 over to the machine shop. The word coming back is very troubling, very confusing. Yeah, I, I just kind of wanted to <clears throat> go over and reiterate everything. I, I need to document the file as well. Yeah. Um, and so the main thing is I, I know that most of the things that were done, I just want to be sure. Originally, when we had the lack of oil pressure and the pinging noise, that's when we took the camshaft out of it, the lifter. Did we take the yep. cam out that first time? No, we time? actually, uh, the first time we uh, focused on the flex plate. That's right, we thought we had a flex plate hitting the or back an of the inspection thing, cover. Which it was hitting the inspection yep. cover. Yep. Then we got rid of that noise, yeah. or we thought we got rid of the noise, and it was actually making a clinking noise over here on the right-hand side. Yep. And that's when we started chasing it from the top down. Yep, pulled the intake manifold, uh, new lifters, new rocker assembly. Remember, so. I overheated this thing because we had no compression in that uh, yeah. number two cylinder. Yeah, we were flip-flopping holes. Yeah, we had compression in one, not in the other one. Then we got compressed in that one, lost compression in this one. Those yeah. should all been signal something was really wrong because yeah. after we got it back together again, we got it uh, running and we thought that the noise was gone, it wasn't. So we ended up taking the engine completely out. And when we disassembled it, we found this black sludgy type stuff in there and all the rod bearings, the main bearings, the cylinder yeah, walls were stored. Were they're scored. And so we sent it over to the machine shop that does all of our work for us. And they called up and said, yeah, it's gotta be bored 10,000 over. So they went to a 40,000th piston because what had happened, according to them, that graphite looking stuff was what happened when the sand was ground into the oil and it turned it that black. Yeah. And so they had suspected that maybe somebody had actually poured sand down the engine. That was their suspicion. And it was near the sand blaster by about 40 feet. So could a few little drops of sand. He goes, this wasn't a few drops of sand. It was a lot of sand. The bottom line is the engine had to be completely rebuilt. Had to go through the heads because they were all scarred. Everything, valves, literally completely, completely. redid the engine. Yeah. All that was after the last time we said it was fine. And now it really is fine. It's got 65 pounds of oil pressure in an idle, which is awesome. Uh, it runs like a dream. It doesn't miss. It doesn't hiccup. There's no noise in it. No. And uh, it, it, truly now we feel like we're done. But fire that up. I, you'll, you'll see, I just canned it off a little while ago and it's like butter. That's awesome. Yep, she's good to go now. All right, good job, buddy. I think we uh, I think we got a happy customer coming. Yeah, we do. The question on everybody's mind is, was the engine sabotaged? Well, these are the facts of the case. January 15th, 2014, the engine was completely rebuilt by our local builder who inspected it this time, as well as myself. January 23rd, 2015, the engine failed. The machine shop reported that an excessive amount of sand was in the engine causing the failure. They also reported there was no way that much sand could have gotten in the engine unless somebody intentionally put it there. These are the facts of the case, and they are undisputed. 
So the real question is, who had access to the engine? Who had something to gain by it failing? Who had the motivation to sabotage it? I don't know now, but I will know. I promise I will know. None of the cars are easy to restore. This particular little car, maybe it has been a little bit more taxing because of the failure of the 340 at the, uh, towards the end of the build, but I have no regrets. I love what I do for a living. This is a, a neat little car. They didn't make very many of them. While it isn't super high dollar and super desirable, it's still a great little Mopar to have back on the road again. You look back over the history of the car and really most people would have just passed on it. It was so rusty. You couldn't see through the rust. The original engine was gone. The original transmission was gone. Really all of the little boxes that you would check were checked to say goodbye to that car. But at Graveyard Cars, that's not what we did. We brought it in, we cleaned it up and we gave it hope. And through that hope, over a course of a couple of years, we are able now to present the world for the first time in probably 20 or 30 years with a completed 1970 CUDA 340 automatic Tor Red EV2 black interior hockey stick car, rear window louvers, rear spoiler, hood pin car. This is very cool, rare, neat stuff that anybody else in the world would have written off and we have brought it back to life. Okay, so he's gonna be pulling that around in a couple of minutes. There it is! <laughs> Wow. Big day. The station will station remain will on, the air, on the air, day and night, day and night. On this very special episode of Graveyard Cars, we reveal the full restoration of our 1970 340 Cuda. Mark and the ghouls have resolved the engine failures. Our newest ghoul, Dave, has completed the assembly. And Mark has detailed the car to perfection. Stay tuned as the complete Graveyard Cars team witnesses the reveal of one of the most challenging builds to date. Okay, so he's going to be pulling that around in a couple of minutes. This Cuda has been here two and a half years. The bottom line is 1970 Cuda 340 automatic rear window louvers, hockey stick stripe, rear spoiler. Where's he at? Where's it? All he had <laughs> I don't to even do was hear finish it. adjusting the air fuel mixture screw. Oh, yes. yeah. Here it comes. It is. <laughs> Big day. Diamond David Lee Roth. Oh yeah. If it was 1970 and you were looking to buy a car, I'm a salesman. I'm going to walk up to you and say, hey, how you doing there? This is old yeah, crazy Earl, crazy Earl, used car. Yeah. 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 <laughs> hey, do you need to jump in and interrupt? You can go ahead and do it. Me. No, do it. Do it all I day. I was talking to Do it, Dave. interrupt freak. Jeez, why are you doing all this? You're an interrupt freak. Yep. Sorry, Dave, won't talk to you. <laughs> hey, this is old crazy Bill down here, crazy Bill used car. Come on down. Oh, Let me God. ask you something, you little filly. What kind of car are you looking for today? Fast car. You want a fast car? If you looked at all the cars around this lot right now, I got the car for you and it is on sale right now. 1970, the brand new body style Plymouth Cuda. You look like the gal, you look like the kind of gal that might enjoy a Hemi Orange or a Tor Red car. You like the color? Yes. You like the hockey stick stripe? Yep. That's right, that's unique to the Cuda. Hockey stick stripe calls out the V8 on them, 340, 383, 440, and the legendary Hemi, which is too much car for a little girly like you, you know what I mean? <laughs> In 1970, this is sexy shit, man. I don't you know what I'm saying? To say to that. <laughs> anyway, let me tell you. Something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you come on over here. You're like a little girl. If you were driving this, Nancy, what would you want to see? You, you like them high back bugger seats? You like that, huh, boy? <laughs> oh my God. That's like a scene from Deliverance. <laughs> <laughs> no, but look at it. You got 340 cubic inch. It's a small block V8, 275 horsepower, 290 if I had the three two barrels, which is available on the AA or on the TA Challenger. Is that a beautiful car, yeah. though? What, what do let's you think? It, I mean, what, what's what your budget? Like Tell me what your budget is. Well, I want to drive it. I'll let Isn't you drive that, it. That's why I came. We don't, you, we don't want <laughs> tire kickers on this lot. You got any money? <laughs> yeah. Where the money? My dad. Your dad. My dad does. He plans on buying me a car. Your dad's going to buy you a car. Yep. And does he have any problem with the driving a 275 horsepower flashy car like this? Because the boys are going to be all over this. They love these scooters. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, if you want to go for a drive, you just help yourself. You hop right in behind the wheel there, take it for a little drive, let me know what you think. I mean, it had a lot of power. I've never driven anything with that much power. I felt like the engine was like, it was your legs, and then the steering wheel, and then the engine. Once so, you got it started? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah, just turn the key up. That's where you let off. Fun. I feel like we're like in a go kart. A, a lot this bigger. Like a well, just like the on, like I'm close. You know what I mean? The car sounds good. It's not rattly. A lot of coupes are rattly. This feels good. No, yeah, it's Dynamat makes it nice and wide. Oh, yeah, oh, isn't that oh. nice? But it was a great, solid car. It was the first one I've driven in probably about five years. So that was nice to go out. I don't think Alyssa took it as seriously as I did. You know, stopping for pictures, stuff like that. Well, you wanna stop and fix your hair? No, I'm, I'm gonna... Take a selfie or... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dang it, I forgot my phone. <laughs> Give me yours, I'll get a selfie. You know, it's that's why we're driving. <laughs> that's, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> It wasn't that bad, though. It was 100 degrees, and there's three of us pinned in the back of that car so Mark could take us out for drinks. With our BS23 H0B 1973 40 Cuda, as you all know, built in Hamtramck, Michigan, completed and under our belt. I'm going to load the crew up, head down to Finn's, get some snacks. That's what you call them. When everybody's piled in a car together, they're called snacks, like on a road trip. It's going to be the best. Anything you want. Ooh, milkshakes. Okay. Uh, no. I want <laughs> anything that comes out. Here, mm. here. Good call. Yelling at me, hollering at me. I don't me. remember hey there. that. Good. How are you? Yeah, you're probably noticing the car though. Oh god. Nope. Do we have she to? Wasn't. Can we not do this? Yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. How can you not notice this? I'm car? Uh, I'm married though, so it's it's okay. Oh, it, darn. Yeah. See, she is saying darn. I'm sorry. Nah. I'm really sorry. Only about human that. for God's sake. Place your orders, you fools. Who? Sorry, Will, place oh. your order. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> no, no. well, boss, thanks for taking us out. Well, yep. really? There they go. Yep, thanks for the milkshake. We had a lot of fun out driving the car. It was so awesome to get in that car and drive it. And it just makes you appreciate your work that much more when you can actually get in and throw it in gear and tear down the road and go, man, I, I, I was part of putting this together. Uh, it's such a great feeling. And uh, I can't wait for the next one. Now with our 1970 CUDA 340 rear window louver car completed, I can update the progress board, which is basically finishing out the last of the pictures that took that car on the timeline from death back to life. Once we're done with that, we'll take them down and we'll move on to the next car. While we just finished one car, there's no time for around. Stay tuned for this season of Graveyard Cars and see the complete restoration of the 1970 Dodge Challenger. Six pack, four speed, E21, A33, FC7 Plum Crazy. After nearly two and a half years of restoration, the owner is anxious and the ghouls deliver on this season of Graveyard Cars.